Welcome to this evening's JMC Live. It is the 1st of September. Welcome into September. Uh, the upcoming fall season. Uh, what do we have for, for the fall? We have what? Football, right? Football is what everybody gets into in the fall. Whether it's your junior high, high school, college, professional football, overseas football, whatever. You know, there's football all year round depending on where you're at. Uh, for you to watch arena football. But yeah, I know that's a real big thing that's on a lot of people's minds is football. But actually, uh, one of the things we'll talk about later tonight is I have to talk about the chair. Everybody wants to know what I think about the chair, what I think about the chair, because, well, uh, they're not thinking about so much Clint Eastwood. They're thinking about the chair. I looked at uh, a Twitter stat about the chair. It was 39,000 followers for a chair. And I was like, what in the world? This is a social media genius. Um, I actually found historic things where they're trying to compare it to the man with the suit, no suit situations and so on and so forth. But I'll talk about the chair later tonight. Actually, the first thing I want to cover is uh, an update on racial reconciliation since the death of Trayvon Martin. This is something that the mainstream media is not talking about because they're too busy talking about what everyone else has done and not trying to fix the problem. So, uh, the Christian uh, Newswire actually shares this story. Uh, this is coming out very soon. About a 30-minute film for, from Chermiza. The uh, program host, Steve Strang, reveals how local pastors, including black, Hispanic, and Caucasian, have taken the lead to confront racial division that spent generations in their city by holding regular meetings and sharing and praying together. He actually says... I was genu genuinely moved how these pastors have passionately stood together and are now reaching out to help hurting people. Their story will inspire audiences across the country to initiate a similar approach in their communities because racism isn't limited to Sanford, Florida. Now this is something I've even talked about right here in Chillicothe, Ohio. I talked about the story of what happened being 30 miles away from Mr. from, from the man that uh, was so viciously dragged in Jasper, Texas. And... Honestly, the story that I shared back then and the story these ministers are sharing now, it hasn't changed. If you want to end this division, we as the Christian church, we as the ministry of Jesus Christ, we need to wake up and we need to fix things. There's even another quote here. It says, There has to be a divine alignment in the church to bring he to, I mean, we're to bring healing in the community. Said Benjamin Pastor of the Central Florida Dream Center in Sanford. We need to bring reconciliation and healing. And that starts with forgiveness. And that was one of the biggest things I have an issue with the mainstream media on either side when it talks about people say things. Is there's no forgiveness, there's no reconciliation. None of this stuff is going to be covered necessarily in the mainstream media. Maybe after the you know the the DVD and everything finally comes out to light and people can actually see for a fact that something's going on. Interesting enough, here it is. The documentary video is accessible live on the Charisma uh, Magazine YouTube channel, and there's a link to the YouTube and their official site at SanfordDocumentary.com. And you can also get more information at ChristianLifeMissions.org. That's what needs to happen all across America to fix a lot of problems. Is the church needs to step up and do its role that we're supposed to be. Because I think, I think that's essential. And I think um, we're, we, we don't get it anymore. We're, we're not um, participating as a body of Christ. We're just too busy bickering and arguing once, once another. You know, we're too busy talking about somebody that talked about a chair or whatever. Um, Harvest America just happened, and, and, and we kind of participated in that by sharing the event and letting everybody know what was going on. Well, actually, there were over 272,000 people that attended the event in more than 2,400 different locations all across the United States. I think that is an amazing feat to see that happen. Amazing time to see people actually wake up, do their part, do their role, and be, be, be part of the church. Be, be the hands and feet that Jesus Christ called us to be. And, you know, um, as we just lost internet right there, we'll just continue to do the podcast because that's not going to stop us. If you're on the, or, 
nope, she's not on anything. Um, you want to go check it downstairs while I continue? Yeah, even though the show gets kicked off the internet for whatever reason, um, that's there's no reason for me to stop because I have more information, more things to talk about. So I have to ask people today, what 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 is the uh, as soon as I can get this cover off my phone, because I need to turn it off. Um, what is the most important thing a church should do right now? What What is the church supposed to be for? And and I've asked this question many times. What do you think a church is for? Why 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 are we supposed to be the church? And how can we, as a church, really reach out and reach the people? It's a question I ask day in and day out. Well... Uh, an anti-poverty activist actually says that the American church is a sleeping giant on the poverty issue. Sleeping giant on the poverty issue. Says uh, the anti-poverty activist is a leader for an international organization. Uh, Jason Feta, director of the Micah Challenge USA, told the Christian Post that uh, American churches should do much to fight poverty with their voice. He says, I think the American church is almost in a sleeping giant that needs to be awakened because the American Christians are powerful enough to uh, elect a president. Whoever the leader is, whoever ends up being the leader, we want them to know this deeply matters to us. And you know, as me, as a minister, as, as someone who actually cares about what's going on in the faith, I totally believe, I totally agree that this needs to happen. We need to wake up as a church. We need to stop these divisional lines. We need to stop making these things be the biggest issue that happens in the whole world. Because I have to tell you, if this stuff doesn't change, if we don't wake up, we are going to have one of the most horrific things ever happen in the history of America. And we're, we're going to have a lot, of, a lot of problems. Because if, if society as a whole continues down the paths that, that I've seen it do, it, it's not going to fix anything. It's just going to keep... Um, running around and around and around in, in so many circles that I, it's just not going to make any sense to me. It's just not going to continually bring forth something that I'd be proud of. I mean, it's it's hand in hand with that whole uh, story about the churches coming together to end racial divisions. I mean, holy... I mean, it's it's a holy miracle from God that you know a church can work with another church because that's how that situation works, and that's the whole situation here with working with the poor and working uh, with poverty. I know there's a lot of people who want to say, "Well, you got to get all the way over to the left to do this to do more." I'm like, no, because there's this balance. I mean, I've been poor, I've been homeless, I've seen people who obviously don't want to change. And I've seen people who, if they were given the right opportunities, would change. And unfortunately, my own experience, I saw more people that didn't want to change. They're like, well, we need more government. Or we, we, I need someone else to do this. And they didn't know what to do themselves. And I think that was the issue, the communication issue. When you get down so far, a lot of people just completely shut off. They they don't have an idea what they want to do. They they can't focus on how they want to continue and the things they want to say and the direction they want to go. And they just keep falling apart to the wayside over and over and over again. And I think that alone is going to keep making things fall apart. Because if that happens, if we're in those situations, then um, we're not going to make it. We, we, we obviously won't make it and if this doesn't change then we're gonna have a big issue um, we are still trying to get the internet back up so we continue the program and I, I do apologize for those that are, are live trying to do stuff um, so we're just gonna keep trying and trying to get the internet back up if it doesn't come on um, we are doing an audio podcast back up here and the studio today, that's what we always do as a backup. Um, but why I'm thinking about it, and I'm trying to work to get the internet to fix. Miranda, what do you think about this issue? About poverty, and politics, and the law, and the church, and racial division. Like, what, what do you think should happen? 
As we've seen in other countries, when the government tries to take care of the poor, it seems like, and, and throws out allowing the average person to help, and they just completely take it over, more people starve and more people die mm -hmm. and suffer because it's completely government control. We've yeah. seen that in Russia, we've seen it in China, we see it in North Korea, we see it in Cuba. We, I mean, they're, they're so... Uh, we see it, we, we, we've seen it in Germany with, with Hitler um, taking control over everything. Yeah. And, and people have starved and died. When we remove the church from... When the church removed itself from helping the people, as Jesus said, who is left to help? I, and that was one of the things I asked one of my friends that was I an mean, atheist. The, government, the government's not um, going to do it all. They're, they're just not. And, and that's the thing. If you realize, if you look at the historic facts of when the Federal Reserve was involved and when you know Medicaid, Medicare, and Social Security and all these origins from 1913 all the way into the 60s, we've had 50 to 100 years of programs where taxes have been raised and lowered and that's not fixed anything. The church has got to get back to the roots. Mm -hmm. We've become so consumed with becoming a business rather than a rather than a soul saving uh, and, and, and a, a life saving entity. We've become a business and we're worried about their numbers and and. Get, popularity and stuff. Yeah. Um, I mean, not every church is like that, but but will you clearly see the decline in churches in the body of Christ standing up and saying, we, you know, we've got to uh, volunteer our time. Let's just not give our money, but let's give our time. Let's go volunteer to, to walk the streets, to, to, to talk to people, to a answer that phone call when somebody's in need that just wants to talk. Now, may, Maybe not asking for money, just asking for your time just to, to sit and listen. Because so many people are hurting today, they just need somebody to talk to. Um, you know, Jerry, we, we deal with that all the time. People don't want our, necessarily our money, and mm -hmm. they want our time. They just need somebody to talk to. And we, we've received more phone calls for just, just it, it, last week we received those phone calls. We received two, and... Two in two days. Yeah. Message on Facebook and a, and a phone call within 24 hours. Somebody just needed to talk about what they were going through. Uh, one was about a suicide. Oh, Another yeah. One, uh, a young man had committed suicide that lived here uh, that you had gone to school with. Yeah. And another person had known him. And they called and said, um, I'm, I'm devastated. You know, this person just committed suicide just, you know, like a, two miles down the road from where we live. You know, he, he stood on a bridge and took his own life. And see, these and, are the things that most people don't know about. I mean, here's an example of standing up as a church. There are 11 churches uniting to support a Bible history class at a middle and high school. Now, check this out. You see that all these people in this picture. Um, but anyway, here's what the story. There's 11 churches that are coming together. They call it the Hickson Gathering, scheduled for September 16th from 6 to 7.30 p.m., at their at their middle school uh, uh, gymnasium. Now, this is the cool thing about all this is how many different people that are coming together. There's different pastors. They say, "I would love to say thank you to the Hickson community for helping us offer a wonderful program to our schools." Hickson Middle School principal, Lee Angela Rogers. The teen years are a time of unprecedented growth, socially, physically, emotionally, and morally. Bible history classes contribute not only to their academic achievement, but personal education as students develop on their own. That's just one of the many, 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 many answers that are given here. Uh, interesting that I see here, a uh, pastor of a church, the Hickson Presbyterian Church, Robert Johnson said, The Bible is the most influential book ever written. It has shaped and transformed our lives across several millennia, and it must surely be a valuable part of any well-rounded education. You know, these are the kinds of things that, that I'm totally supporting. Now, I know there's going to be atheists, and there's going to be other people, and other things that, well, I shouldn't have that. Then make a class about atheism, and study about what you why, why you don't want to do that. Go ahead. But don't tell me that you can't learn a historic fact about that. See, that's the issue. 
You know, I don't believe in the multi-faith issue, but I mean, if you're going to live in a country which is America, the land of the free and the brave, then I'm not afraid of what you believe in. Go ahead and teach all these different things. All that, you know, just make it where, make it where what you want us to, what you want us to do, which is, I don't want my child to do that, so I want it to be an option. We'll make all these classes optional, not requirements, and teach on it. Make a whole day of what all these different faiths are. Make it a whole week. Make it optional. Make it where the parents have to sign a waiver. And make religious freedom actually happen in the United States and quit bickering and arguing about half facts or no facts. Now here's the interesting thing about free speech. Uh, the, uh, the there are free speech uh, rights of political activist groups overturning the Supreme Court decision of the landmark Citizens United versus FEC case. Here we go. Over the long term, I think we need to seriously consider mobilizing a constitutional amendment process to overturn Citizens United. Obama wrote during a question and answer on a, on the website Reddit on Wednesday. Now, the issue is, is whether or not, how can free speech happen? So here, here's something that happened from uh, an opinion from Chief Justice John Roberts. He wrote, the government urges us in this case to uphold a direct prohibition on political speech. It asks us to embrace a theory of the First Amendment that would allow censorship not only of television and radio broadcasts, but of pamphlets, posters, the internet, and virtually any other medium that corporations and unions might find useful in expressing their views on public concern. You know, you got to be careful when it comes to this free speech stuff. I know it's real creepy for some on what they want, what they don't want, but um, you have to stand up for your rights as an American citizen. You have to stand up for what the Bible stands for, you know. Uh, speaking about standing up for the Bible, a Chicago pastor won a three-year battle to uphold his freedom to speak in public. Mock and Baker attorney says police shouldn't shut down free speech. You know, free speech has benefited Martin Luther King Jr., D.L. Moody, and most recently pastor in Chicago, Kurt Teasdale. You know, uh, eight members of his church were talking to the public about the gospel and handing out scriptures. Probably tracts is what we call in the church. And a three-year battle with the Federal Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals we affirmed Pastor Teasdale's free speech on public streets. He was arrested and jailed. And in 2008, the case was dismissed by the criminal court, but Mockenbacher attorneys uh, representing Teasdale uh, filed a suit in 2010 for the federal court. Um, Andy Norman, attorney for Mock and Bacher LLC, who represented Teasdale, says, Police officers should protect free speech, not shut it down. The appeals court recognized that Americans on public streets shouldn't fear arrest or harassment for exercising fundamental freedoms guaranteed by the First Amendment. Now we have an example of this here in Chillicothe, Ohio, where someone felt their free speech was offended. Uh, Romney came into town and he was going to use the road in the area. The Secret Service had that area blocked off. You couldn't be on the corner of blank and blank. And somebody was there, and they were told to move, and then they felt like they weren't their freedoms were blocked. So they figured out later on they could get further back and weren't offending the bus route. So I mean, it works for those that are wanting to follow Christ, and it works for those that don't want to. I don't see what the big issue is why we have to keep fighting over this. You know, uh, Pastor Teasdale said free speech is something no American should take for granted. Countries around the world censor Christians for their religious expression. I do feel blessed to have. To have been part of this journey as long as it was. I just think that is amazing. Just to see America stand up for freedom. Honestly stand up for rights of citizens. Even though some people don't agree with Christianity. But we're supposed to have free, be able to practice our religion. And I feel like Christians and even some other religions that I've seen, depending on who you talk to, they feel like they have to be in a little tiny box. In a house, and that's the only place. And I'm like, all, almost all religions say you need to be able to do this out in public with some things. And, and, and I understand there's this rule and regulation on stuff. And I don't think we should make rules against people like myself doing a program like this. I go out in the street and minister to people. I don't think I should get arrested for asking someone, do you know who Jesus Christ is? Do you know he can save you? That shouldn't 
Because, you know, it's one thing if I keep beating someone over the head and I'm getting real offensive on it. If they just say no, I just go to the next person. Hey, do you believe in Jesus? How dare you? I'm like, no, it shouldn't be how dare you unless you're offended by it. I'm sorry you're offended. Have a nice day. Go to the next person. You know, I get pamphlets from people who want me to free vaginas and free gay marriage and all sorts of things that I may not line up with. They have a freedom to do that. That's the kind of America we live in. You know, and it, it, the issue is, is I mean, I don't feel like I don't want to follow something. I don't have to. That's where the free will part comes into. It's so, so interested, you know, in how that really plays out. So, speaking of pro-life, uh, there's a community to remember the victims of abortion at the Time Warner Arena in Charlotte as the DNC prepares to start. They were laying 3,300 flowers in front of the Time Warner Arena on the 31st. 3,300 flowers represent the number of innocent children that are aborted every day in America. You know, that is quite sad that we have to do this. And uh, I'm working on... Uh, two things. One, with a, an interview with a Harvard Law Review friend um, about Obamacare. And then I'm working on something for pro-life too. So then you can actually see some facts. Because when you learn about uh, Roe versus Wade, who is Roe, and what is she doing now since that case? Did she tell the truth during that case? And what is the future of that going back to court, you'll be quite surprised of testimony and things that have happened since that big case. Because around here, um, I see women talking about how that was the greatest thing since sliced bread. But when you look at a law document based on the testimony of the woman that originally spoke about this, you learn about a lot more. And I've asked people, do you know who Roe is in Roe versus Wade, and they can't answer. They don't know who anybody was. They just know what happened. I'll save that for later because that's going to take me about an hour or more to just go through on its own because there's just so much information. Now, speaking about information, this could be something quite historic. Now, I remember uh, the University of Cape Town researchers believe they found a single dose cure for malaria. Now, I remember, as I was saying before, I interrupted myself because um, I'm getting too ahead of myself here, is I had to take malaria pills, not shots. These big, big pills, about almost half the size of my thumb, and uh, they made me dehydrated when I went to South Africa. And I didn't know why I was taking these. They said, well, you got to worry about mosquitoes. Um, well, this University of Cape Town Science Department believes it's found a single-dose cure for malaria. Um, I think this is quite amazing, um, because... This is supposed to be uh, an amazing time. Professor Kelly Chibel and her colleagues, they, they discovered a drug over 18 months of trials that killed the resistant parasites, meaning malaria, instantly. And they say they did it, animal testing, it was safe. Uh, Professor Chibel says, this is the first ever clinical molecule that's been discovered out of Africa by Africans from a modern pharmaceutical industry drug discovery program. The potential drug has been tested on animals, has been shown that a single oral dose has completely cured those infected with malaria parasites. Could you imagine a cure for malaria so people could live? I think that would be great. So they don't have to die because of a disease? I think that would be great. Well, as, as many of you know, that when I went to South Africa, I was homeless uh, at a shelter and transitioned from the shelter to the, to the experience of going to South Africa. Well, speaking about homeless, and this kind of brought a tear to my eye, uh, Vermont Burlington, um, an offering by a group of homeless Christians in Vermont, they gave $69.40 to missions. Just saying that alone, without hearing any more, I'm already starting to tear up. Because I think, I remember the time when I would find money on the ground, or I, I had to get money, I would turn around and give it back. So I, I understand um, how this works. Uh, and it's just amazing. Uh, Dorset, Terry Dorset, a director of the Green Mountain Baptist Association, has asked... Uh, the association's 35 churches just to match the donation. He says, there's a whole subculture of homeless Christians just trying to live for the Lord. 
So I challenge you today, if you want to help the homeless, give $69.40 specifically for homeless. I, I, I'm totally in agreement with this. Give $69.40 to a homeless shelter. I challenge you all to give $69.40 to a homeless shelter. Uh, Dorset also said, I think we tend to think homeless people just as being a bunch of addicts and people with problems. And then while that does describe many homeless people, there's a whole subculture of homeless Christians who obviously don't have those problems and they're just trying to live for the Lord in a different lifestyle setting than most of us might choose. You know, people said, well, why didn't you choose a different path? I said, well, I knew there were homeless people in South Africa and... They, were, they wouldn't listen to a regular teen or anyone else. And they had a different response to hearing a homeless American talk to a homeless South African. Because a lot of them were from Mozambique and from Sudan and other places. Uh, at that time, Mozambique had a flood and stuff. And they were on their squatter camps. So they were from different places in South Africa itself. And they didn't have an official home as they were kicked out of their homes by different people. And so it had a better, it had a better message. Speaking about a better message, um, I also challenge you to sign the Open Doors Advocacy Campaign for Religious Freedom. Uh, the, they're, they're wanting to get support for the Senators uh, in a request that they co-sponsor the S-1245. And this is sponsored by Senator Roy Blunt of Missouri that asked the President to appoint a special envoy for religious freedom near the East and South Central Asia. Countries in this bill include the most oppressive places, Christians and other minorities. Um, there are 2,500 Open Door supporters who have already signed and contacted their senators about this bill. I've already contacted mine. There will be a link below for you in the video uh, info section about how you can uh, contact your senator about religious freedom. Because I think that's most apparent. And then something a little more closer to home, University of Cincinnati. Federal court here in Ohio for the University of Cincinnati. Here's what's going on. Free speech zone. It's about student rights. Uh, what happened is the University of Cincinnati was prohibiting free speech. And uh, United States District Judge Timothy S. Black issued a permanent injunction against the UC's unconstitutional system of speech restriction. I think that's amazing. I really think it's great. Because that's something that we totally need to do. Limiting student expression is just 0.1% of the campus is bad enough. Threatening to call the police if students were caught gathering signatures for a petition was even worse. The decision to waste taxpayer money defending such an unconstitutional censorship was completely indefensible. I, I'm totally, I think it's just amazing. That, you know, we're going to be able to stand up for these kinds of things. And I'm not going to read any more into that because the point is, is if we just sit by, I, I know this goes for both sides, Christians and non-Christians. And, th and that's the thing. I think non-Christians have got this more figured out than Christians today. Um, I hear and see more Occupy and more uh, progressivism and liberal stuff than I do cause Christianity. If you could actually... Tool, retool and reevaluate life importance. I think we could actually see a change and bring more people to the gospel because I think that's one of the issues. We're not really um, bringing people to the gospel. We're not really fixing things. We're not changing how things should be. Now here's a weird, creepy sci-fi thing, and I thought I was making this up, but it was on that TED Talk stuff I talked about before. Is your mind capable of being hacked? I'm not making this up. Um, scientists are trying to test a cheaper device. Um, you know how we already have, you place devices on your hand and all this stuff that monitors your sweat, your heart rate, and, 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 and all this other stuff to verify if you're telling a lie or not. Well, what if you could... Put something on your hand that can verify what you're actually thinking. 
on the feasibility of side channel attacks with brain computer interfaces. I know that probably just made you blow your mind. It says the security risks involved in consumer grade BCI devices have never been studied and the impact of malicious software with access to the device is unexplored. We take a first step in studying the security implications of such devices to demonstrate that this upcoming technology can be turned against users to reveal the private and secret information. We use inexpensive, and here's the big word for you, EEG, electroencephalopathy, based on BCI devices to test the feasibility of simple yet effective attacks. So in other words, and there's a video that you can watch from Ted that I'll post where you can see this head thing, and I'll show you the head the headset. Here's the headset, and it's supposed to read. I, I don't know all the technical jargon on it. I kind of know some of it. Your brain is uh, an electrical device. It, it's, this is to explain it real quickly. Well, apparently they learned to figure out what this frequency is, and any thought and memory you have is supposedly on a frequency. Well, this is a device that's supposed to decipher your frequencies in your head. I'm not making this up because it was on Ted, and Ted doesn't sit here and you know just say things. So I'm kind of wondering, um, is this something new? Has this been around for a while, and it's just being publicly made known? Because they say they're the first ones to kind of talk about it. Because I know a lot of times things come out to the public, but it's been out on the private sector and the military, something else, long before uh, the public ever knows. But Kind of like penicillin. It was actually used during World War II and uh, wasn't public yet. Now, another thing that's going on, the GOP party is actually uh, endorsing not, o not only um, illegal pornography, but they're wanting to enforce the hardcore pornography already existing laws. Now, you you, you got to realize what I mean when I say already existing laws because th this is something that I think many Americans have no idea what a lot of the facts are and what some of the laws have changed. Like, um, some, like, like bodily fluids. Um, for those that are in the medical community and you're a doctor or a nurse and or if you have the MSDS or whatever the acronym is for that because I'm just rattling off the top of my head on it but anyway if you get in contact with bodily fluids and you're at a regular job or you're in the medical community you're supposed to immediately desanitize de sanitize desanitize because that's what we're doing we're supposed to sanitize the area clean yourself up and block it off and say you can't go here because this happened until if it's a severe enough um, bodily fluid issue you have to block it off you have to bring in special things I mean it, it gets all the way to the extreme where you have to bring in a team when somebody dies to, to clean out in a home or whatever well there's laws right now in America that, that, that dictate exactly how a pornography company can produce films where they can produce films what can be shot and without getting too graphic there are certain things that a person could do to themselves or to someone else that are currently illegal but are still happening. And I know people on the left want more of it to happen because some of the laws on certain things that were deemed a mental illness are no longer a mental illness. Like playing with certain bodily fluids with yourself or someone else is no longer a mental illness. So they're trying to get to this point where just about anything can go. Um, so like I told one of, one of the people I know that's on the left, I said, well, if you really are for that, then you're going to have to make a law going against the current law. And then they couldn't respond because I showed them the law. I said, here's the law, the obscenity law against this act. And I said, if you're really for wanting to do this, you're going to have to get that overturned. And they're like, I didn't know that was illegal. I said, Yes. 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, this stuff was illegal. I mean, this isn't like something that just happened, it, you know. And, and that's the point. Um, and here's what the, uh, here's what's been said. Uh, President of Morality for, uh, in Media, Practic A. Truman, says, Distribution of obscene or hardcore pornography on the Internet 
is a violation of current federal law. And this is a level of higher level of pornography because we're talking about, and they're talking about just about all pornography, just about, that if you don't have the actual identifiers on the bottom of the website, that, that you're, these things are being saved, this stuff's being blocked, you can't just go through without it being, you know, an adult consent, blah, 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 this goes on, 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 on. Uh, that's what's happening. I mean, the, the average age of someone looking at pornography now is 11, and it's pretty, um, it, it worries me of, and I know we live in, in, a, in a country where nudity and all that's more taboo than violence, and you go to another country and nudity is okay, but violence is bad. I'm looking at the Bible, not different cultures. And as far as I, I see, sin is sin. There's no differential in God's eyes, and that's the kicker here. You know, we're too busy trying to look in our own eyes, their own ears, and our own own thoughts on this, and it just doesn't it just doesn't line up. It just doesn't make the case. And you know, when we wake up and see America change into something that we don't want anymore, you know, I, I have to ask people, what is it? What is it that you actually do want? And so many people that I've talked to, I mean, now we have like pastors. In America, 60% of some pastors, depending on the size of the church and the denomination, don't even believe Jesus was born from a virgin. Do you see how close we are to a complete implosion of the Christian faith in America? I'm not even going to an extreme and say that it's the end of the world because I can't say that. I don't have any facts that it's the end of the world. And even if it was the end of the world... Only God knows the answer to that. I, it doesn't matter how smart I get, how much research I do. It doesn't matter if i got the top 50 million people in the world that have all the information about stats, figures, and whatnot. We still never get an answer to that. So, I, you know, as, as a Christian, as a husband, I want people not only educated, I want people to be prepared because the Bible says that we have to be able to preach in and out of season and um, I'm not see, I'm not seeing too many people saying that they're ready for that. That they're honestly ready for understanding what the Bible is, and that's a whole other thing that I'm looking into of how many people don't have a basic understanding of the Christian faith like they did a few years ago. Like they did when they were... Because the way the church has changed now is a lot of places don't have Sunday school anymore. Um, they don't have a midweek service anymore. They can't afford to keep the doors open, much less afford to even pay a full-time staff. So what do you do? I mean, now we have it where you can have your cell phone and get the free access to the Internet... And you can get free access to the Bible on your phone. If you have a Wi-Fi connection, you get the free access, of course. But, I mean, court, most people have to pay the data fee. Um, but if you don't have access to the Internet, you still got to use the regular Bible. But what I'm getting at is, if you have a question and no one's available to answer it for you, and all you can do is sit in a pew on Sunday and you sing... And you may or may not pray anymore because some churches don't pray together in church anymore. And then you go home. How are you going to know what what you what what this all is about? One of the one of the things that I'm working on is the JMC Bites uh, devotional series. And I've started out a little soft, but just picking a little one topic, something quick and short. I wanted to get a few of those out. So people could hear a subject and know what the Bible is about. Eventually, we're going to start Cross Effects Church. And we got videos on that. And I'm also coming up with another idea of actually doing kind of like a Sunday school type scenario where we take a book of the Bible and we discuss it. It's a plan I've thought about for a while. I've been reading and praying and waiting for the time for that to happen. But I realized I couldn't get to the full intense meet unless I had all this other stuff leading into it. So that's probably not going to happen until about December at the earliest. Maybe not till next spring. It really depends 
on how much I can get recorded. Speaking about recording, we've gotten uh, the JMC Rewind series. It's it's about done. I got about three or four more of those to go, and they'll be released um, all throughout now, the rest of the fall and spring season. And same thing about JMC Bites. So look forward to the upcoming uh, Bible uh, program, two more programs, the uh, Cross Effects Church, and then eventually some kind of uh, Bible study on different books of the Bible. But I, I got to get, like I said, that's going to be like 66 videos, and I am not ready for that level yet until we get some of the basic core stuff out of the way with the JMC Bites. Now, everybody knows that one of the biggest topics that everybody wanted me to talk about was the chair. Um, I saw this speech. I don't endorse the in, the insinuated um, questions that Mr. Eastwood did. and um, But it was actually clean. It called out Republicans and Democrats. But while everybody's not thinking about his speech, what are they thinking about? They're actually thinking about this chair he's pointing at. And I sit here for a while, and, and I think he pretended to have a problem with his voice, because I've heard him talk before. It can be pretty clear. And, and yes, he is 82 years of age, for those that are wondering how old Clint Eastwood is. Um, I know my grandmother and mother loved watching his old westerns on TBS as a kid. Um, I heard about Dirty Harry, but I've never seen one. But I want to say something. He still can't beat John Wayne on westerns. Um, Brandon says he can't beat John Wayne on westerns. Although, yeah, if, I'm sorry. That's although, the way although, I feel. although, if he was asked to be the remake for the for that old John Wayne movie, it would be between him, Tom Selleck, and who? Who's the other guy, Miranda? James. No. Yeah. Uh, Sam Elliott. Oh, Sam yeah, Sam Elliott. I always, I always do this wrong. But anyway, back to the... Neither a while do I digress. You look at this chair, and um, I looked on Twitter, and I'm not going to pull that up, because I want you to look at this. Twitter has a, a, a Facebook page for a chair. For I can't, the chair. I can't figure out who necessarily is the um, political party behind the chair, but the chair itself has 39,000 followers, actually more than that. Um, Facebook, one page I found on Facebook's got 23,000, but it was a Wikipedia page about the chair. People will follow a chair. Um, I remember a few years ago, somebody says, can we get more uh, views uh, for this sandwich than for um, for a slice of bread or something or whatever? And they got like a million followers. Uh, the whole chair thing is now called Eastwooding. And... Uh, it's kind of like, reminds me of planking. I don't understand either. I, I'm not young enough to get it, but I'm old enough to get it. Uh, what's happened here, essentially, is you have people, if my grandmother was in her, you know, still alive, which that would be almost an impossibility, but if she was still alive, you, you're connecting people that are anywhere between the age of 100 all the way down to someone who's like 13. Because they both, the, the older generation wants to mention the Gran Turismo movie and, and have Clint Eastwood say, get off my lawn. Torino. Torino? Okay, I say that wrong. My, my, my apologies. It's the type of car uh, he owned. It's the type of car apparently he owned in a film. I kept, think, I kept thinking, uh, here's what I kept wishing he would have said. If Romney wins, he's going to take Obama out, out of the White House and tell him to get off my lawn. <laughs> Miranda want yeah, that's what Miranda wanted him to do. I, that's what I kept thinking, but then everybody wanted him to say, make my day. But Yeah, because I, I, I'm i wondering if he was going to do the get off my lawn thing, or while he was going to finish that whole thing, because it looked like he got interrupted by someone in the crowd to yeah, say, to make my day. Yeah, said, say, make my day, and he says, I, I don't say that anymore. He yeah. says, you say it. <laughs> so he made everybody say, make my day. Yeah, so... That in the nutshell, I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, I've seen clean pictures. Uh, the the most the most interesting ones I've seen about a picture of a chair uh, was, uh, Mom, why didn't you make me a sandwich? I've seen that. Uh, I've seen others of why did teacher give me bad grade? 
Um, why why do I have to go to class in level three snow emergency? Um, why do I have to go to work today? I've seen all sorts of weird. They call them memes or maymays or whatever they're called. Well, what it comes down to, he got the younger generation's attention. Yeah, yeah. And and he got the older generation's attention with that. Exactly because you know I've seen right in the left sitter talk about this stuff, and. You know, while both are arguably right, that, you know, he shouldn't insinuate what he did. Um, I've also seen people on both sides say, well, for a comedic a, co a, co a comedic stand-up routine, mm -hmm. if, if you were in a crowd, a full crowd or wherever, and all you brought on stage was an empty chair, and you stood there and talked to a chair, if you didn't do it the right way, you wouldn't have entertained anybody. They would have thought you were just boring. And he made people laugh, whether it was right or wrong. Yeah. Um, so that's all. He this, got their attention. He got people's attention. That with stuff. was the. That was the you know, whole. Point. Like, like I mentioned to people, he said that uh, one of the things that I that I have to say, and this is the thing that I think most people did not hear when um, they were reading. Excuse me, when they were reading this speech, I ended up finding what I consider. Um, like the most effective piece of his speech, and while I get that loaded here, um, I know this is just such a difficult time for Republicans and Democrats and Independents or whatever they're called, because you know right now it's it's just everybody's so angry and everybody's hurting. Doesn't everybody's matter, hurting. Party you are. Everybody you know, is hurting. Everybody is scared. Everybody's doesn't trust anybody because it, it, we're we're living in such uncertain and and uh, chaotic times right now. Yeah, and I mean that was something I I, I had an issue with, but yeah, I actually wrote down uh, and I just found it here because the most effective piece of Eastwood speech, and this is what I'm gonna share with you because I don't think most people. Uh, Paid any attention to this because I had to pull this up so you could see it, um, and you can see it most effectively. Um, as such, here it is. Here's what I found: the most effective piece of Eastwood's speech. You, we, we own this country. We, we own it. It is not you owning it, and not politicians owning it. Politicians are employees of ours, and so. They are just going to come and beg for votes every few years. It is the same old deal. But I think it is important that you realize that you're the best in the world. Whether you are a Democrat or Republican or whether you're a Libertarian or whatever, you are the best. And we should not ever forget that. And when someone does not do the job, we got to let them go. And... You know, most people have only quoted the bottom part about the job. They don't quote the part about Republicans, Democrats, and Libertarians, or whatever you are, you are the best. And that was the thing I was talking about in, in a group. And what you just saw was actually from a group. I'm not sharing what anyone else has to say, but because I don't have their permission. But I wanted to know what anyone else thinks about this. So you can chime in on on our pages and let us know what you think about that because like I said as a minister you know as seeing this being told I need to review this and give a question and answer of what I think and yes I am sitting in a chair I think just the chair part alone is okay I wish I wish Republicans and Democrats could just get on air and just say the facts it's like well we have 23,000 23 million excuse me 23 million people on unemployment and or well, this person wants to cut this program. Well, this person wants to add to this program. And here's what they did. And then let's let the viewers decide. But no, as I talked about the other day, I honestly feel that some journalists and some news organizations are not news organizations anymore. It's a bunch of actors who sit in front of a teleprompter and talk. Everything that I'm saying is coming out of my head as I say it. The only time that I'm not saying what I'm just saying is when I'm reading the facts and I'm showing it on the screen so I can't be accused of not of saying something that somebody is, else is saying. The journalism has law... The, the, the journalists... I don't, they're not even journalists. 
You can't even compare them to journalists 20, 30, 40 years ago. No. Because they have lost their integrity. And, and that's the thing. They, they, they don't report the news. They are biased. They, they have their own special point. They don't, they don't share the facts. They share their point of view, their opinion. You, a journalist is not supposed to share their opinion. They're supposed to share the news, the facts. Get the facts out there. And they're not. And, and see, that's why we did the show the way we've been doing the show for since, like, what, 2008? Uh, I share the facts, and then I say a little bit about the opinion. And normally I agree with what's being said, so there's not really any issue. I can tell you when I have a problem that Christians are, you know, being attacked based on what's happening here. And I base my opinion on the facts, and I don't get attacked. Um, I don't get attacked because I'm not getting paid for doing any of this. Because I feel like if I can remove the veil of anything that can consider make me bad when it comes to these things, then the right and left don't attack me so much because I'm, I'm just saying facts. You know, if this guy said that, you know, I don't have to agree with it. And this is happening. We need to fix these things. I think America is in a need of heart surgery. That's right. And I said that in a group the other day. I've said a lot of stuff in a group the other day. And today, we, and I don't get any comments. We heard a sermon about a heart, uh, getting a new heart on Sunday night. And uh, the pastor was talking about their, uh, they had uh, butchered a, a deer. Yeah. And they had this old deer heart and it was all rotted and decaying. And, and, and that's kind of like how people's hearts are before they know the Lord. Their, their hearts are just rotted and decayed. And, and Jesus need, has to come in and give them a, a heart transplant, give them a new heart. And... Uh, it was a really great sermon about um, about uh, salvation and, mm -hmm. and and how Jesus can and transform your life from the inside out and give you a new heart. And exactly. it, you're right, Jeremy. Uh, what America needs is is a heart transplant. You know, we we have one group of people who want a pay raise, but then you have another group of people that um, can't that wants to save their money. Uh, you have another group of people who don't want to do anything but just get more government help. Then you have another group of people who have used government help such as myself and have transitioned out of government assistance and sustaining on its own. I'm kind of in transition because I have a little bit of both right now. But I hope to be continued as an example of a success story of being able to move beyond circumstances. And I think that's one of the issues. Are, it's time to do some tough love in America for some people. And other people, they need more help than ever, especially the homeless and others. And others um, need to stay right where they're at because they're doing quite well. There's multiple things that need to be done to fix America. And I've been looking at stats and figures and all sorts of things about this for quite some time. Trying to say, if I was the president of the United States, or if I was the, you know, the financial, you know, Federal Reserve, or if I was whoever, how would I fix these things? And I can tell you, Jesus Christ can fix your heart. He can fix the country. He can fix these problems in America, where America can be a beacon and a light for the rest of the world. Because that's the way it used to be. It used to be where people wanted to come to America. And now people aren't coming to America or much anymore. And other people aren't going anywhere else. You know, there, There's more people dying in the world than, than you realize. There's more Christian persecution in the world than the um, last hundred years or so that we can really document. And this is a defining moment of what's going to happen regardless of who gets elected. It depends on the decisions that are made after that. Politicians can make promises and can have plans, but if none of those plans work or they don't even get to happen, then nothing's going to change and it can get worse. And one of the things that I support is what my grandma, excuse me, what my grandmother talked about. And she talked about what her parents, her grandparents, and her great-grandparents did. And I saw pictures. She was born in 1923 in Texas. So she knows a little thing about uh, before the federal income tax 
started in 1913 and before, you know, a bunch of other things had happened. And she said what, it, what worked for her on the farm was her farm helped the other farm down the street and the family helped each other. Yes, back then there were 10 to 12 kids, so there were more people to get things done. So what I'm coming down to is, is we need to learn to help one another more. Because the government is not the only solution to this problem. It's never been the only solution to this problem. Because Americans are capable of... Uh, and all citizens in the world are actually capable of doing this. Making choices on their own as to how they can live. And if there's too much government involvement, then there's a problem. If there's not enough, then there's a problem. There's a balance. But as Christians, we were told to help one another. To love one another. To look beyond political parties and, and, and whatever class that you think you're going to be in and help one another. And I'm not talking about spreading the wealth because <coughs> I'm not talking about social justice. I'm talking about being a servant of Jesus Christ. That's completely different than any of those things. Because being a servant of Jesus Christ does something that none of those things can do. It transforms your heart. It leads you to salvation. And it brings you a new life. See, this was kind of the message that happened back then, right before the, you know, the big crash in the 20s, and then World War II and the other crashes. I mean, if you look at history, how many times has America been in a depression or a recession? It's more than 10 times. And have we recovered? Yes, we have. But the kicker is here, is a matter of ingenuity of what you really want to do. Because, as I've said, um, I totally believe that if we help people, and, and like I said, with my personal experience in homelessness, um, I know there's a time and place that uh, some people don't want to be helped. And they'll literally tell you they're so stubborn, they don't want any help. There's other times that you help people and they just take advantage of you. But in God's eyes, He still wants you to help people, even if any scenario happens. Because there could be a successful story like mine. Um, that's why I talked about doing volunteerism and internships. See, I'm looking at like the transitional pieces of what needs to happen in America. I've been looking at the different things that actually need to happen to make America something great again. Um, I don't think many people understand the capability of what Jesus Christ can do for an individual and if he, that individual is truly changed what could happen for that whole place where that person lived that's what I really think needs to happen today um, I don't think uh, pay raises are going to solve it because I don't really see many people wanting to uh, give those pay raises and as bad as America is I don't really see how we can afford to keep giving pay raises when we've tried to do that for a hundred years and that hasn't really fixed everything. Um, it's got to be a balance of the two. In some places, pay raises. Some places, you know, freezes. Some places, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And I'm hoping that politicians and others actually wake up to more wisdom defined as the Huffington Post would say, the common denominator in the issue. Because what I'm looking at is people and political power that can't make anything happen together. It's a Republican Democrat, and they vote all no, or they vote all all yes. And there's all this anger amongst each other. I think Republicans and Democrats need to forgive each other and try and uh, come to a plan. I really think people need to uh, wake up beyond these things that that are in our land and bring us to a place where we can thrive again you know we, we used to have a surplus in our country we really did we used to have 
money to pay for wars. We used to have, you know, things to help each other. We didn't have an extreme amount of taxes and a extreme amount of different things that complicate complicates the system here. You know, I think things need to become more simplistic and not so difficult. It shouldn't take someone with a PhD to understand the tax code for as you know I mean I understand they do need a job but for the average American citizen I know a lot of them can't do their taxes on their own they don't understand it you know I had a hard time understanding it before I went to college and stuff and I mean I'm telling you from experience I mean good grief um, but for I, I know there's Christians and, 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 and Republicans Democrats Independents Tea Party uh, blah, 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 whatever else you are that listen to this. I don't know your political affiliation. Uh, that's not really my business unless you tell me. But uh, I think it's time we follow Jesus Christ as our first and foremost answer because that will fix a lot of problems. And I think a lot of Christians need to uh, fill in the gap and uh, learn to serve one another again because... We could be our own solution without the government involvement. You know, I've seen things where things are so bad in some places that businesses are telling people that you can't get a job if you've been out of work for more than two months. They'll just throw your resume in the trash. That's what you get disqualified for. It doesn't matter if you've got a PhD or what. You've been out of work for two months, you can't get a job. Other places, you got... 2,000 some odd college graduates and your city and your whole county has absolutely no college degree work available for the majority of those degrees outside of nursing. It seems nursing is like the number one job all over the, the U.S. but beyond that in some places it, it there's nothing. You know, we need to learn to fit the pieces together and be the hands and feet that Jesus Christ called us to be. This has been JMC Live tonight. It is September 1st, 2012. I'd like to thank you guys for tuning in to this program this evening. We will be on air again next week for next Saturday's show, 9 p.m. Eastern. God bless you, and we'll see you soon.